that could possibly exist. Oh. Um, Our that thanks is such there. A sweet yeah. Story. To Whit Johnson there. How about that for a Valentine's Day gift? Sure beats flowers, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's what's making news in America this morning. Have a great Monday, everyone. It's Monday, February 13th, and if you see something up there, maybe duck for cover. We start here. After being accused of dithering over the Chinese spy balloon, the U.S. military shoots down a series of objects. Three times the U.S. military has shot down unidentified objects in three days. So are these incoming all at once, or are we finally just paying attention to them? With a death toll rising past 30,000, Turkey starts arresting construction contractors. Prosecutors are accusing them of trying to flee the country. There are structural concerns and political concerns here. We'll walk you through both. And he joined one of Russia's most feared armed units. Now he's fled the country. On a regular basis, his comrades were being executed in front of him. How to escape when borders mean nothing. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. To hear U.S. military experts describe the infamous Chinese spy balloon that floated over the U.S. for days, the biggest concern was not that this balloon was learning our most intimate secrets. Any military installations that might have been in its path are already wary of satellites any day. No, the biggest concerns were a, apparently this was not the only one. We're learning about balloons over South America and Asia, along with others over the U.S. in recent years. And therefore, B, how had we not spotted these things earlier? Well, on Friday, we got word that the U.S. had shot down another flying object. From all indications, uh, this object is potentially similar to the one that was shot down off the coast of North Carolina, though smaller in size and cylindrical in nature. Then another on Saturday and wait for it, one more on Sunday. And if you thought the military was less than forthcoming with that balloon in Montana, well, thus far, they haven't even confirmed what President Biden authorized shooting at. Let's go straight to ABC's White House correspondent, Mary Alice Parks, at the West Wing right now. Mary Alice, I think I speak for everyone when I say, what is going on? Like, I'm sorry, we were worried about one balloon and now we're just shooting these things down left and right? What What's happening? It, it is absolutely remarkable, Brad, just the pace and frequency here. It is very clear that the U.S. has completely escalated how they're policing the skies. I mean, you outlined it three times. The U.S. military has shot down unidentified objects in three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, one off the coast of Alaska, kind of the northern tip. Basically, we're talking about icy Arctic waters. Uh, one where they worked with the Canadians, actually in Canadian airspace, shooting it down in the Yukon. And then we're hearing of this latest one, an object that was detected all the way from Montana, going over Wisconsin, fall up the, the upper Michigan Peninsula, and taken down over the Great Lakes, Lake Huron, kind of near the Michigan-Canadian border. The intelligence community and the military knew about the Chinese balloon about three days before the White House did. And so there's a little bit of, we're not going to get fooled again here. Clearly, they are looking at what is going on differently. And like you said, they are acting a lot quicker. What are these things? Like, I'm, I'm not used to talking about UFOs, seriously, right. but it sounds like we're just being told, like, unidentified flying objects. I mean, what are we talking about? I mean, the real question is we don't know. The Pentagon, the White House, still not confirming it. And that is remarkable when you think about that one that was shot down in Alaska on Friday. They've now had time to get military assets there. I mean, they say that it, the conditions are really bad. They're talking about s snow and sleet and dim conditions. I mean, Arctic conditions. It would not be prudent for me to uh, speculate on the origins of the object at this time. But still, uh, several days now, uh, and they still can't confirm what this was that they shot down, uh, let alone the other two. No wreckage uh, recovered over the weekend yet that we have updates on. We are hard at work now recovering the debris to better understand certainly the capabilities of the surveillance balloon from the PRC, 
but also the nature of these unidentified objects. And I think that that is um, very telling with kind of the new approach, like you mentioned, sort of a shoot first, ask questions later approach. Canadian and American fighter jets were scrambled uh, and an American F-22 successfully shot down the object. All these questions still about what these last few objects were. And th for them to take such action, send up a military jet, shoot things out of the sky uh, before they could even confirm what they were. You know, we did get some answers from NORAD in a briefing just last night, but uh, still so many questions about what they knew and when they knew it. Certainly the event off the South Carolina coast uh, for the Chinese spy balloon, that was clearly a balloon. These are objects. We have some um, some sources telling us that what we what we do know as far as what these things looked like, that they looked um, the one in Canada, we're told, was sort of cylindrical. Uh, the one that was shot down off of um, Lake Michigan, basically, we were told octagonal. In all cases, they seem to be much, much smaller than that suspected Chinese spy balloon that that we all tracked as it way, made its way across the country and was taken down in South Carolina. That was significantly bigger. And right away with that one, the U.S. government, uh, you, you remember, very publicly said that they knew it had surveillance capabilities. They knew it had all this technology, um, They that it had this sort of spy capabilities. With these other ones, it seems like we're talking about something very different. Now, I haven't ruled out anything. Uh, at this point, we continue to assess uh, every threat or potential threat unknown that approaches North America uh, with an attempt to identify it. The big question is, could they have been just completely benign? Could they have just been right. weather balloons up there? Well, because I was going to say, either there's a fleet of these things being released recently or what, like, this is just stuff that's always up there. But if this stuff is always up there, Mary Alice, are we just not seeing it? Most of the time, because that seems like a problem. Yeah, I mean, I do think that we're seeing a lot of frustration from members of Congress that maybe we weren't just looking at the skies closely enough or paying close enough attention. There's clearly a political aspect to this, that after that Chinese spy balloon was, you know, just so brazen, went across the whole country, was so big, had all this technology. I think it clearly put the White House, the Pentagon, on a high alert, that they, they don't want to get caught letting something else float into U.S. airspace. But we're also told there's kind of a technological part of this, too. And so with some adjustments, we've been able to uh, get a better uh, categorization of radar tracks now. And that's why I think you're seeing we, these overall. We had one senior administration official that told us they basically retooled um, the radars to see more of what was up there uh, and fine tuned uh, what they were looking at above. And so I think it could be kind of a combination that they feel the pressure to not take anything for granted. And they are, uh, you know, checking more stuff out that maybe before seemed so little or so not serious. They, you know, it, it, they, they had decided it wasn't worth their time. Right. And what's so bizarre to me is that the White House basically spent a week saying, listen, it would be crazy just to go shooting down stuff willy nilly over land when we could do it, when we could just wait and do it over the sea. Like that, that would be nuts just to let all that debris from an F-22 fall along with whatever is in the air already. Well, now we are shooting these things down. And by the way, like it's going to get pretty expensive if we're throwing missiles from F-22s at everything we happen to see in the sky. If indeed like, this stuff is just always up there all the time. Uh, Mary Alice Parks at the White House. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brad. Next up on Start Here, someone's going to jail over Turkey's building collapses. It's just a question of who. We're back in a bit. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. After an extraordinary news-making year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. ABC News, America's number one news source. After a disaster like the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, you might expect this huge amount of deaths reported at first, followed then by small updates as more bodies are found here and there. 
That's not what's happening, though. The number of reported casualties is actually accelerating. The death toll now more than 21,000 dead. The death toll has now climbed about 28,000. death toll rising to more than 33,000 people. You might remember last week when a Turkish policy expert said, yes, this is clearly a time to grieve, but also... This is a time to be angry for anyone who's ever watched Turkey's construction boom over the last decade. Anyone who's seen these buildings go up with shoddy material and knew one day they might come crashing down. And if you thought it was too soon to say that, well, it's not too soon for Turkish people or now for the Turkish government. Over the weekend, Turkey announced it would be hunting down more than 100 construction contractors and arrests have already begun. ABC's Ibtis Nguyen Food has been on location in Turkey since the hours after this quake. Ibs, what type of charges are we seeing here? Yeah, so Brad, at least two property developers have already been arrested at airports. Uh, prosecutors are accusing them of trying to flee the country. Uh, Yavuz Yakarakus uh, is a contractor of many of the collapsed buildings in Adiaman. That's uh, one of the cities um, near the epicenter of that earthquake that has seen uh, some of the biggest, most shocking damage that our team has seen here on the ground. And he's been arrested while he was trying uh, allegedly to escape to Georgia. Turkey tonight issuing dozens of arrest warrants. Turkish officials targeting more than 130 people allegedly involved in the construction of collapsed buildings that crushed thousands of families as they slept. Another contractor uh, was a contractor of a 14-story luxury apartment building in Hatay, another hard-hit area here in Turkey. Uh, many local outlets uh, reported here that this contractor was also arrested while trying to flee the country. One building stands still and then the next one is down. There's clear Clearly, um, sloppy construction. You're seeing here a lot of anger and frustration over building standards. Um, although the quakes were powerful, uh, some experts have already come out saying that uh, properly constructed buildings should have been able to stay standing. And uh, we have spoken here uh, to disaster responders, volunteers from AFAD. It's a government disaster response organization. And they're used to dealing with this type of event. And they told us that the problem is in part with the lack of structural components, indeed. Uh, we've seen ourselves the debris in Adiaman, mainly, that we've seen collapsed buildings, and you can clearly tell that it's just bricks. It, they were just made of bricks. There was clearly uh, no or very little structural fixative, uh, no steel to reinforce the concrete. And these uh, re disaster responders also told us that when there is iron or steel to reinforce it, the di diameter of that iron uh, used is often too small to be effective. So there is an issue here on the quality of the building components used, a quality that is below uh, what is required by the law and by these codes uh, that were supposed to ensure that in earthquake prone regions, those buildings could uh, stand that type of event. And of course, these uh, volunteers also um, pointed to the corruption, saying that uh, some of these buildings simply shouldn't be built so high according to regulations, but bribes are often used to counter these restrictions. Yeah, Ibtissim, I'm trying to get a sense of, is is this the government, you know, saying these people are trying to flee the country, we need to issue charges sooner than later? Or is it the government realizing, hey, we're politically vulnerable right now? And President Recep Tayyip Erdogan saying people are angry right now. They're going to start being angry at us if we don't do something. Let's let's really focus on the contractors. Yes, absolutely. Uh, they uh, are realizing that uh, this is uh, turning quickly into a situation that they have to manage. Uh, people are desperate, but they are getting angry now. <laughs> Many locals uh, told us that for the first few days they were on their own uh, trying to save uh, their neighbors or their relatives on their own digging through the rubble. Um, and that frustration over the rescue efforts um, was uh, for the first few days uh, very strong. And then now there's another layer of frustration on top of that because there's this feeling that uh, so many lives didn't have to be lost or endangered. Um, and that, in fact, there could have been helped. Uh, 
And now this, the authorities are, uh, are cracking down on, uh, on those uh, developers. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is a critical issue now because we are only at three months from uh, m presidential elections. And President Erdogan visited some of those hard hit areas and pledged to rebuild. These cities are in fact uh, uh, usually firmly in his uh, party's stronghold. But this earthquake happening now, these calls against corruption uh, are concerns for this government. Uh, that might try uh, to uh, prove itself now. Uh, and um, in fact, there are concerns now that Erdogan might even try to move the elections, uh, blaming it on the need to focus on uh, the recovery after this earthquake. All right, that is Ibtising One Food on the ground there in Turkey. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brad. In recent days, Ukraine said it was expecting a series of Russian assaults. That's what they've gotten. This video reportedly showing Russian forces seizing control of another village near the city of Bakhmut. A top Ukrainian commander telling ABC News this is the most difficult phase of the war so far. But they're also now reporting that more Russians are dying on the battlefield right now than any time since the earliest days of the war. And perhaps not coincidentally, since Russia invaded, we have seen Russian troops defecting at every level, leaving their battalions and heading anywhere else. Sometimes, in fact, those defections have shed light on groups that technically wouldn't be called soldiers at all, not official ones anyway. And ABC's Patrick Rival recently spoke to one of the men who fled one of the most notorious groups groups in Russia. Patrick joins us from Kiev this morning. Patrick, first of all, what is this group? Wh which group did this guy belong to? Hi, Brad. Yeah, I mean, this group is called the Wagner Group, and we've known about them for many years, really, for about a decade. They're a private military company, and basically the Russians created them at a certain point to essentially have their own Blackwater group, you know, a group that would be separate from the government and that they could use with a certain level of deniability by the Russian government in Syria, they were used in Ukraine, they're currently all over Africa. The Department of Treasury will be designating Wagner as a significant transnational criminal organization. They were set up by a man who's called Yevgeny Prigozhin, who has known Vladimir Putin for a very long time. In the last few years, he has set up this private military organization. He's also set up troll farms that interfered in the US presidential elections. But what he's really become known for is for Wagner. <laughs> Wagner have become the assault troops of the Russian military, and in particular in eastern Ukraine right now, are playing a key role in trying to gain ground. <laughs> and proving to be one of the few parts of the Russian military that is able to make advances against Ukraine. Saying in an audio message, our boys were very upset at suggestions that other Russian military units helped capture land. They're also known, though, in particular for their extremely brutal tactics. And one of the reasons they're able to make advances is that they essentially are completely indifferent to the losses they sustain. They've been recruiting inmates from prisons across Russia. They were allowed by the Russian government to do that. Wait, like current inmates, Patrick? These are not like ex-cons. These are like, you're in jail, come work for us right now? Exactly. I mean, there, so there's a video of Yevgeny Prigozhin arriving at a prison in Russia and saying, if you fight for us, then some of you will die. But if you survive, then we will give you a pardon. And this is recruiting people who are imprisoned for serious crimes, such as rape and murder. And it worked initially. Try to remember very well that there is no need to return to a prison camp. You do not need to be convicted and imprisoned to return to war. They appear to have recruited thousands of inmates. But once the inmates arrive at the front line, they discover that Wagner is operating completely beyond the law, even Russian law. And they're operating according to tactics that are actually very reminiscent of what we used by Stalin in World War II, which is if you retreat, you're executed. Well, it's interesting how not a traditional Russian military unit this would be considered. So you spoke to a man who served in the regular military, then he volunteers for this group, then he defects after his very first tour. Why? Yeah, so this man is very unusual because he's pretty much the only person who has managed to flee Russia and flee Wagner and defect into Europe. I'm ready. You good? OK. Um, his name is Andrei Medvedev, and we met him in a hotel in Oslo where he is now claiming asylum in Norway. 
They are throwing people in as meat with small arms on armored vehicles. By his account, he believed Russian propaganda that when he got to Ukraine, he would be fighting a defensive war, he would be fighting fascists and neo-Nazis. But he says as soon as he arrived in Ukraine, he realized that actually he'd been tricked by Kremlin propaganda. I saw how they brought two people to the training ground and shot them publicly because people are refusing to fight. And not only was he invading Ukraine, he was part of this unbelievably brutal force where on a regular basis, his comrades were being executed in front of him. Those refusing to fight would be beaten or executed. The best outcome is that they would just beat them very badly. In the worst outcome, they shoot them. And so he decided that he had to escape. Yeah, if these people will kill you for not fighting immediately, what do they do if they find you trying to escape? I mean, according to him, he says that he basically spent two months in Russia in safe houses being pursued by Wagner's security service. And after two months of hiding in Russia, he manages to reach the Norwegian border. And he makes his way on foot. It's snowy. You know, it's very, very cold. But he manages to get through the forest. He says he escapes on foot across a frozen river, pursued, he says, by bo Russian border guards. And then when he makes it across, he, he just runs into a Norwegian village and starts banging on, on doors saying, I need help. And now the Norwegians have listened to him and they, they believe his story. And he is now living under the protection of the security services in Oslo. Well, and so as far as next step, like, what does he do now? And also, like, when it comes to Russia, does Vladimir Putin have deniability over these guys? Or is it, is it a given that, like, he knows what they're doing in Ukraine? I mean, the irony is they were created in order to give the Kremlin a certain deniability in conflicts around the world. But there, zero is the, is the simple answer. There is zero deniability. Mm. Earlier, I told you that I needed your criminal talents to kill the enemy in the war. Those criminal talents are not needed now. But what we've heard in the last few weeks is that essentially in the assaults that they've been making, they've exhausted themselves, that Wagner has actually run out of people, they've run out of prisoners, and no, and no prisoners who are left want to actually join up because they've heard these stories that, you know, at least 50% of those who are going have been killed or wounded, probably far more. When we met Andre in, in Oslo, he was extremely nervous. When we were sitting in the hotel bar, he kept looking around. A man walked past us at one point, and Andre was looking right at him and saying, like, what is this guy doing? Why is he looking at me? Someone needs to tell this. Someone needs to tell people so that people know the truth. There's a Russian saying, if you fear the wolves, don't go into the forest. He's basically living under the protection of the Norwegian security services at the moment. But certainly there is a, a very severe risk that he might be the target of assassination by Wagner. Un unbelievable. All right. Uh, Patrick Rievel, there in Kiev right now. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. Okay, one more quick break. When we come back, Harry Potter is a lot less fun when someone accuses you of cheering for Voldemort. One last thing is next. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Reporting from Ukraine on the biggest war in Europe since World War II. I'm Tom Supi Burridge. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And one last thing. If you have gamers in your life, they might have spent this weekend playing the new game based on the Harry Potter franchise, Hogwarts Legacy. We leave our legacy in your hands. Or maybe they didn't. Because in a world where everything, everything carries social responsibility, this video game has become a proxy battle over J.K. Rowling. If you buy the Hogwarts Legacy game, you are contributing to transphobia. I think 
this as separate from the world of Harry Potter. That's right. The author of the Harry Potter books, who's made a fortune off her franchise, has also become a face of transphobia to many critics. And what's so tricky here is the people in this country most likely to support trans rights, namely people under 40, are also the most likely to have grown up on Harry Potter. Somebody asked her, how do you sleep at night knowing you've lost a whole audience from buying your books? Rowling's become a muggle to her own target audience. I read my most recent royalty checks and find the pain goes away pretty quickly. And so in online spaces, what would usually be a debate over a game being good or bad have become debates over whether we should be playing that game at all. Supporting J.K. Rowling is an act of hostility towards your trans friends. In one camp are those who say we shouldn't be patronizing Rowling, full stop. They're not playing this game on principle. In the other corner are her supporters. I'm sure it will sell like gangbusters. The thing about this uh, transgender stuff is people don't care about it. But then there's the very large camp of folks who see shades of gray here. No disrespect here, but what makes someone a bad person is going on an app and labeling a group of people, children included, transphobes because they purchased a video game. For one, Rowling herself insists she's not anti-trans, even though she's claimed trans women are a threat to the feminist movement. Then there are the folks whose careers are much more impacted by this game. The developers have gone to great lengths to tell people Rowling has not been part of this process and that they don't share her views. In fact, some players have concluded there's a transgender character in this game, perhaps as a subtle protest. The immersion is just so amazing. Don't let people take that away from you. Some gamers caught in the middle have been laying low while playing it all weekend. Others have said it's okay to play because they're donating to trans-friendly charities. Even if you consider yourself an ally, even if you yourself are trans, you are contributing to transphobia. And that is not an opinion. It's a fact. Which takes us back, though, to these gamers who are insistent that if you play or take part in any aspect of Rowling's empire, the movies, the theme parks, the Broadway show, you're enriching her and therefore supporting her views. To them, there's no such thing as a subtle protest, no gray area. There's a scar over the entire franchise, which has led to a more radical form of gamer protest, loudly posting to gamer chat rooms how Hogwarts Legacy will play out. That's right, they're intentionally flooding the internet with spoilers, which in turn is leading to some to rush order the game, paying a premium just to avoid the snitches. You know the best game? is the most analog game of all. It's during the Super Bowl when at whatever party you're at, you get that little box raffle game thing where you get assigned a random square and you hope to match the score. Well, I finally, for once in my life, won the big prize yesterday, but really wasn't even me winning. It was my buddy Kevin who picked squares for both of us. Shout out to my boy Kevin, by the way. And of course, Kansas City Chiefs, good job, but the box game was especially fun. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. <laughs>